All right, so good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this session in our Enabling Canadian Innovation Virtual Conference. Before we get things started, there are a couple of quick housekeeping items to mention. So you'll see a questions box in the GoToWebinar panel. Simply enter your question as they come up and we'll do our best to get them all live. But if we run out of time, we'll be sure to follow the afterwards. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Sue to get us started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today in our SolidWorks 2021 Accelerating Innovation and Adapting to Change webinar series. Bienvenue, bienvenue à tous et merci de votre participation. Bien que la présentation se fait en anglais, notre équipe France, francophone, ce sera un plaisir de vous contacter par la suite en français. We have lots of exciting information we want to share with you for the next hour, including a live demo and a new term you'll hear a lot today, dynamic optimization. We're going to discuss how to effectively build a resilient supply chain. Our team and our customers believe that one way to overcome supply chain disruption is to leverage Industry 4.0 technologies. For example, COVID has taught companies that they need to build a domestic supply chain to keep production moving and revenues incoming. As well, prior to March, many companies didn't collaborate using Teams, Skype, GoToMeeting, and other platforms, but we had to learn how to continue to work and hence adapted. Next slide, please. I'm Sue Cellini, Director of Sales for Eastern Canada. I've been in the additive space for just over three years. I'm passionate about helping companies adopt new technologies for design freedom and production efficiencies, exactly the stuff we're here to talk about now in our presentation. I'm joined by Deep Singh, who is our VP of Additive Technology. Deep has over 10 years of experience in additive manufacturing, from research in cost optimization and functional application of additive manufacturing, to global and domestic OEM collaboration in the additive ecosystem. Next slide, please. We're joined today across Canada by our additive manufacturing support specialists. William Gawkey in Alberta, Morgan Marash in Ontario, and Jean-Maxime Merlot in Quebec. These gentlemen have their cameras facing their printers. That's what you see at the top of your screen. William has his camera on the Mark II in Calgary. Morgan is with the Metal X in Toronto, and J-Max is with the X7 in Montreal. Next slide, please. So today's presentation will focus on what is involved in the supply chain. We'll take you through a SolidWorks additive manufacturing design workflow. We're especially excited to show you digital manufacturing with our teams in their various offices. This means we'll be sending multiple digital files to our 3D printer fleet to fabricate a tangible part without the need of a logistical chain for distribution, further reducing the carbon footprint and making for a more sustainable process. We will discuss the overall theme of Industry 4.0, and we're also gonna introduce you to a new, new term, dynamic optimization. So please stay till the end to learn what is dynamic optimization. Next slide, please. Here are some CAD microsolution fun facts. We were founded almost 40 years ago as a reseller of CAD software, which was built out of the need to, for real customer support something lacking at the time and sadly in many cases today too. Our business has grown since the start of COVID. We opened three new offices across Canada. We did this to get closer to our customers and to gather the best talent across the country to build a solid team. We've added new experts and tools to our portfolio such as simulation and metrology. All specialists across our five offices collaborate with customers oftentimes together on projects. We have technical expertise in many areas, including software, hardware, training, design, support, and much more. We carry many partner products, many of which complement each other or serve a special segment. Now I'll hand the baton over to Deep for the exciting part, the real reason you're here today. Thank you, Sue, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to speak to you guys about a very hot topic that's discussed these days. And that's really around supply chain and bridging the gap of supply chain disruption. You know, when we look at a conventional supply chain ecosystem, we look at the origin of the part, 
manufactured at maybe a different facility, different part of the world. And there's a whole thread of supply chain distribution network that ties to that, which adds time and additional cost until the part gets to the point of need. And that's really, in a summary, some of the supply chain concepts that you see exist today. So what happens when you have time and you have cost that gets added to your workflow? Well, you start having customer unsatisfaction. They're not receiving the part in time. Or you might be in a mission critical part and you need a part to fulfill the role um, and that's not coming in time. Right? What about some of the parts like you're doing prototyping? How do you get to the market quicker? Uh, maybe there's maintenance, repair, and operation parts that require supply chain. Or even low volume production could be considered uh, as a benefit when you're starting off in your, in your journey. We, we noticed a big disruption globally in the supply chain market when the pandemic hit. There was a shortage of personal protective equipment for the frontline workers. There was shortage of ventilator parts. Manufacturing companies, like the automotive companies, halted because of an outbreak in, in, in the pandemic. People had to work remotely and can, the work had to continue to go on. Safety modifications had to come in place very quickly to be able to continue the operation of your business and to continue to keep the economy going. Some of the pictures you're seeing on the slide demonstrate additive manufactured parts using some of the industry 4.0 capability that was printed during the pandemic. Canada participated also in creating their own domestic supply chain. We had customers across Canada who leveraged the additive manufacturing process to secure multiple government contracts and to provide personal protective equipment to, to those who need it. And the beautiful part about these designs were that they were made in such a unique way that conventionally it would take you weeks and months to create the tooling. There was parts that were moving, living hinges, all sort of complex design, the freedom of a design that typically would require designing for a manufacturability. So there was a lot of benefits realized during that process. A digital file was created, shared across the group, across the globe, and people with access to printers, those who had obvious level or entry level FDM printers were printing face shields and giving it to their local facilities. Those who had industrial printers were printing nasal pharyngeal swabs and providing a real solution to diagnose the problem. So at CAD Microsolutions, we really believed in order to overcome the supply chain challenges that one is facing today, there needs to be a strategy to overcome the supply chain challenges. And it really starts from generating a digital twin. This is where SOLIDWORKS is not only a tool, but it's an essential component of starting your digital twin data. Once you have your digital twin, you can leverage that digital twin to do multiple initiatives around in enabling innovation. You can do cloud collaborations, you can do internet of things, you can do 3D printing, you can do all sort of different elements. And we can help in this category. So what we did for today's demonstration, um, we took a case study. So here's a company called Square Robot. They're a startup company. And what they do is they make these wonderful lightweight robots they go in areas where humans can't possibly go. So this is a petroleum tank inspection robot. And because they're a startup, they need to keep the inventory low. They need to be quite agile in their process of manufacturing. In some cases, they're outsourcing manufacturing as well. And we took this one bracket as an example, and there's hundreds of different parts to choose from within the robot. But for our demonstration, we took this bracket now we're creating a scenario where this bracket is an essential component to the robot because it holds a vision system. If you can't see where the robot is going, then you're not gonna be able to do a, much of an inspection. So this is why you know, holding that vision system in a certain way, keeping the part lightweight is going to be really, really important. 
So think about a scenario where if you know your bracket is damaged during the previous inspection, and you now need a bracket that's re that's a replacement bracket, you could consider a couple different options. If you have inventory in house, which I see on almost daily basis, speaking of companies, some have you know multi million dollar investments in their inventory management program, and they hardly get to use the parts that are there, or they are using it frequently. But in order to just keep one part, they're outsourcing 10 parts because that's where they get the uh, price break. So one is you can select the bracket from your inventory that's already there. Two, you can manufacture in-house. You know, if you need an urgent part, you're probably going to make a lot of people quite angry because you're going to have to put their projects on hold and put your project forward. And maybe you're using your CNC machines to do less value parts and when there's unplanned downtime and all the rest of the projects get delayed. So that's another option. You can use in-house manufacturing capability, existing CNC board, or you can outsource this part. And we actually went to a couple different partners uh, who own some of the machine shop facilities. And the earliest time that we received on a quotation was about three weeks lead time. That is not acceptable when, you, when you're in a mission critical area. So three weeks lead time and the price ranged anywhere from $500 to $1,200 for that bracket because the five axis CNC machine was involved. So what we just did, we said, okay, let's take this bracket and let's use SOLIDWORKS workflow and ultimately let's use industry 4.0 technologies like additive manufacturing, like 3D printing to fabricate this part. So the first step we did, we isolated this part in SOLIDWORKS as a part file. And in SOLIDWORKS, there's a feature that's print 3D feature. And it's available in all the different SOLIDWORKS platforms. So if you go on that print 3D features, you can define overhangs. And, and overhangs are really the areas where you're adding support material. And it could be the same material, or it could be water soluble support, it could be breakaway support. And all you're really doing during your manufacturing process, you're supporting that overhang. And in this picture here on the second picture, the red region that's identified by SOLIDWORKS platform, it really highlights these are the areas where you're going to have overhangs. Further, it's going to add the cost to your parts because you're using more material. Additive works by adding layer upon layer upon layer as a process. And you're adding more time because you have to add more materials. So cost, time, and also think about sustainability. The part that's a support material is not going to be used. That's going to be a scrap part. In some cases, that part you can't recycle again. So we have to think about sustainability in our design. So this is where we leverage design for additive manufacturing principle. So what we did is that slot that was there just to reduce the weight, could be designed in a different way. In this case, we changed it from more of a cylindrical profile to a diamond shape. And by that, we're able to create a geometry that is self-supporting. But we're doing this entirely in the SOLIDWORKS ecosystem. We're not leaving our SOLIDWORKS environment. We can then go back to Print3D and verify these overheads. So in the second Print3D picture, you're realizing two things. One that there is an elimination of support material in the middle bracket, in the, in the component where there was a cylindrical slot. But two, we also changed the orientation of the part by further reducing and minimizing the overhanging structures. <clears throat> Once you're happy with your design, you can export that as an STL. And what STL does is it creates a tessellated format of your CAD file which is kind of universal for almost every 3D printer platform that's available today. But some of the challenges that you have with STL is that it's approximating your design because it's using a tessellated or triangulation way to generate the end, end file. And in many cases, those who have worked with 3D printers and 3D printing files realize that during that tessellation stage, you could have challenges where you could have some of the triangles that are overlapping 
there could be triangles that are missing there could be areas where there's void generated and there could be uh, triangles that are not meshed properly this is where we we can leverage the 3d experience platform and 3d experience platform is a really really powerful tool for collaboration you can work with your colleagues on multiple projects but in this case what we did we used the app in 3d experience platform called the 3d printing preparation app now when very quickly we were able to identify areas where repairs were needed clean up the mesh and by cleaning up the mesh when we take the file into processing for the printer in the printer software it takes less time because now there's less errors that the software has to deal with and you get the quality that's that's optimal so moving after we have processed our file we can bring it into a digital file processing workflow in this situation we're using markforge iger software and what the iger software allows us to do is select where we're going to enforce uh, continuous reinforcement of carbon fiber, Kevlar, or fiberglass. Also define process parameter. Do we want you know, different level of infill structures in our part? Prior to additive manufacturing, it was very challenging to control the infill density of a part. Now it's just a click of a button. You can select whether you want 100% solid part, you want 37% part, you want honeycomb structures, you want triangular structures, and all have their pros and cons depending on the type of functional application you're going after. The other unique feature that's in this uh, ecosystem, in the Mark Ford ecosystem, is in process inspection capability. What that allows you to do is scan a part at a respective layer that is critical for you. You can do multiple layers, you can scan them. And the printer will send you an email after it's done printing that layer. So you don't have to wait until the whole part is done printing. And it'll send you the data and say, you know, your design or your fabrication of this part is within X, Y micron of precision. But it does in process layer inspection. So we're inside the part, kind of like what a CT scan would do, but we're using a laser scan. In this particular instance, this part was within 100 and a plus minus 100 micron. And our standard deviation in Z was 19.8 micron accuracy. Plenty and a lot more than what we really needed for this bracket. Another part of our business that my colleague Robert handles is our 3D scanning and 3D metrology side of the business. So if you wanted to scan the entire part and compare it with your CAD, you can do that using metrology. It doesn't happen internally with a 3D printer, but it can be done using another industry 4.0 tool like 3D metrology. And the benefits of that could be shared for a long, long time by digitizing inventory. If you are interested in attending Rob's uh, presentation, please scan this QR code. This will allow you to register for the webinar that's happening next. And Rob will use the same part and take that through his 3D scanning and metrology ecosystem and demonstrate the capability of another industry 4.0 tool. So before we move on to the live demonstration, I wanna emphasize on these pictures that you're seeing here. So this part, this bracket was printed on Friday night. You can see the timestamp. The part was released at 11.30 at night. And on Saturday morning at 10.35, I get an email from the printer that your part is done printing, and the printer sends me this picture um, with the part sitting inside the build. Really, really powerful. I did not have to be, I, I didn't have to come to the office for this. This was done remotely. So that leads to the next part of our presentation, the digital manufacturing workflow. So here I have an example of just an Excel sheet of digital inventory. You can have hundreds and thousands of parts cataloged in this way. What I'm doing here is instead of having a tangible physical inventory, I'm keeping it as a digital inventory only. 
So let's say right now we want to print a part out of metal, stainless steel, 17.4 is a requirement. We can click on the link with our digital inventory and it'll take us to a file that's already prepped up and ready to be dispatched to the printer. So here in this case, this is our Metal X printer that, Mor that you'll see on Morgan's screen right now. Effectively, this file is ready. It's already been processed parameter. It's a digital catalog that we're saving. This was previously printed as well. So we, we, we have this file as a proven concept. You can see the estimate time of printing is going to be 14 and a half hours. You know the amount of material required. You know how much the cost of the material is going to be. And simply, we're going to select the printer that we want to print this on, and we're going to press print. We're going to say print now. We can add it to the queue, and we can then go to the machine and physically release the queue, or we'll just simply press print. You can be anywhere in the world, and with a click of a button, you can send parts across the world. So if you keep an eye on Morgan's machine, it will begin to warm up. It'll begin to uh, print part. We'll come back and take a look, but you'll see now that print heads is moving. It's going to home position. And through this digital thread, we can monitor what's happening. We can see right now the print heads are heating. We can see real time temperature. We can see how much material is already loaded and what part is getting printed. More to this, we can also do entire printer management, a fleet of printer management doesn't have to be one printer. In this instance, we're managing three separate printers located at three different parts of Canada. Right now, the Metal X, we just released the part, is printing. On the X7, we started the print this morning, and we can go and look at what's happening. This is in Quebec, by the way. So I'm based out of Toronto, but I can see what's happening in Quebec. Right now, our plastic temperatures are 275 degrees. Our fiber nozzle temperatures are 230 degrees, how much material is loaded. We can also look at images that the printer takes during intervals on how the print is going. And you can see on the screen at JMAX, John Maxim's uh, screen, that the printer is printing this part live in Quebec. Further allows our team to interact and communicate they can upload parts, I can print parts, I can print parts, they can share parts. This whole digital chain of thread, it's really, really neat. You might be wondering why uh, nothing's happening on William's printer. So we're gonna go through another part demonstration on William's uh, machine. So we can see that right now the printer is ready. There, you know, there's the temperature is, uh, it is ambient temperature. We know how much fiber is loaded, uh, plastic is loaded, fiber is loaded. And let's go um, upload a part. So we're going to import a part. We're going to select the right units. So this part was designed in Imperial units. We can select the orientation at which the part's going to be printed. We can manually rotate the orientation as well to make it fit into our belt. Now we can select some process parameters. For example, I don't really need this part to be printing at 100 micron layer height. I can have it printing at 200 microns because it's going to be a fit and form. Or because this is for a demonstration, we don't really need a, a scale one to one part, we can do scale half or any selection of scaling. We can select the infill, so let's do hexagonal. And then we can process and create a G code that is all happening in real time. And again, the value of this is that you don't have to be on site. You're, let, you're disrupting the supply chain. You're not involving a logistical ecosystem um, chain. This is all happening digitally. So this part is going to take an hour and 47 minutes. And of course, this is scaled down. The standard part is taking about eight hours. And $2.33 in material, uh, $2 material cost. We can internally view the part. Maybe there's cavities in the part where you want to uh, embed nuts, bolts, magnets. Or maybe you want to do in-process inspection. 
So that all of that visibility is available. But what we're going to do is we're going to send this part that we just processed, we're going to send this to William's machine in Alberta. So we're going to set print. We, we already know the plastic is loaded. He had 5,500. Uh, 555 cubic centimeter of plastic, so we only need 9.86. We can verify that. But let's say you don't verify, the machine will tell you that you're going to run lower on plastic. So it will pause, give you opportunity to add more plastic. So we're going to hit press print now. And please keep an eye on William's machine because it will also uh, accept this code from Toronto and start printing this in Alberta, in Calgary. Okay, so we can monitor in the real time what's happening. Let's go back what's happening on our metal X. So we're getting closer to our heating zone. We're almost there. And once the heating element is complete, then we'll start printing our part. And this is how you leverage industry 4.0 technologies to overcome some of the ecosystem challenges. So moving along with the presentation, some of the things that we demonstrated demonstrated in this demonstration is that we've moved away from part inventory, physical part inventory to digital part inventory. We're collaborating, collaborating within our organization. But with that comes a risk of security. So MarkForge is one of the companies where they're ISO certified, ISO 27001, which really looks at Skyver security of how the file and the data is being shared. And that's really important as you start collaborating on the cloud. There's real-time improvements. We're printing three different parts, one scale one-to-one -one on JMAX X7. On William's machine, we're printing the same part at scale down version on 0.5. And on Morgan's uh, machine, we're printing a metal part, which is going to be dynamically optimized, suited for application using some of the generative design principles. Really, really powerful tool when we start leveraging the IoT ecosystem, another component of industry portfolio. So here we touched on some of the elements. We talked about cloud collaboration. We talked about Internet of Things, additive manufacturing, 3D scanning. There's all, there's all sorts of different elements you can do, design, simulation, validation to enable you to do more. But it all starts from digital twin. Virtual reality, augmented reality is also part of the strength. We leverage that during the pandemic. And we'll talk about that on our online uh, forum where we helped a company overcome some of the challenges using augmented technology. And finally, the other concept that, that we really want to uh, people to take away from today is dynamic optimization. Because of that one part that we got a quotation that was going to take us three weeks, it limits us the ability of different designs that we can do. If you go into the injection molding space, you're further limited, but you then overcome some of the volume constraints. But with additive manufacturing, here for in, in this instance, we're using 50 different unique designs that could be printed in 15 hours on an HP multi-jet fusion printer. Out of those 15 designs in 15 hours, you can very quickly verify which part you really need. And ultimately, we ended up going with this part that was designed for the application. So very quickly using a dynamic optimization approach by avoiding that logistical supply chain uh, thread we were able to overcome some of these really unique initiatives by using dynamic optimization for design. And finally, we took the same part that we dynamically optimized and we integrated that into the Square Robot workflow. This concludes my presentation. I'm going to pass it to Sue. And Sue, I'll pass that back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deep. That was uh, extremely informative and very interesting. So we have some time now to take your questions. We'll get back to you after the webinar for those we can't answer today. Uh, so now I'm going to pass it over to Sarah, and I'll come back a bit later. So next slide, please. 
Oops. So thank you, Sue. Uh, we do have some questions in the queue. As a reminder, if you do ask us a question, you're automatically entered into a draw to an Ecobee thermostat. So if you have any questions, shoot them to us now. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, Deep, the first question I have for you is, in the demonstration you have shown, the printers you were using were all within Canada. Would this supply chain work across different countries? Thank you, Sarah. That's a really great question. And, and absolutely. Um, as long as you have your internet taking advantage of that industry 4.0 ecosystem, so you have them connected on the cloud, you're leveraging the unparalleled uh, cybersecurity ecosystem. You can distribute a digital file uploaded in a different part of the world. In fact, a couple of years ago, I was in Germany for the Forum Next uh, Additive Manufacturing Conference. And we had a urgent need of uh, benchmark. And I sent the file from Frankfurt Airport. By the time I arrived at Pearson, and our office, our head office is not too far away from Pearson, the part was already there, it was ready. So you do have that access to completely digitize that workflow. Amazing, thank you. We do have a, a question that came in. Um, so uh, says, Hi, the application MarkForge come, does the application come with a 3D printing machine or can it be purchased separately? And I think he's referring to the software. The software we use today uh, is a uh, software that is uh, specifically designed for the MarkForge ecosystem. Um, MarkForge is kind enough to enable that for people to go online and, and experiment with their own files but it is currently uh, restrictive to that ecosystem. However, there are other uh, printers and technologies and softwares that are available that allow you um, to configure based on the type of equipment and machine that you're looking at. But this is the trend that we're seeing, that companies are moving more towards that cloud platform. It may be currently a limitation of the hardware that's, uh, that's available, uh, but MarkForge has definitely overcome those challenges. Awesome. Uh, the next question I have for you is where do you see 3D printing fitting into the supply chain in the next five years? Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I, I don't think it's it's a next five years conversation anymore. I think it's it's what's happening now, right? Um, pandemic was an eye opener. Um, we had a company in the US design a uh, Health Canada approved uh, face shield design um, but instead of uh, sur supplying with the face shields, they supplied with the CAD file um, to those who had access to industrial 3D printers. And then local companies were able to secure contracts and provide uh, solutions until the, the tool up was done for injection molding. Um, so I think it's happening now. Uh, in five years from now, I think it's gonna be an integral part of our, our ecosystem, just like anything that we experience like Teams and. And, and go to meeting is now an essential component of how we conduct our business daily. And I think the 3D printing ecosystem uh, with the Industry 4.0 uh, strategy is going to be a, a no-brainer. It's going to be an expectation that you're going to have from every printer you buy. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, next question I have for you is, in your presentation, one of the elements you discussed is augmented reality. Can you describe how CAD Micro is currently using AR? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we have a, a core business in our uh, portfolio where we look at immersive display technology. We can work with point cloud data, uh, CAD data, live data, and really um, help people visualize. No different than what Square Robot is doing where people can't go into a petroleum tank to inspect. So just like that, there's, there's a lot of different areas where um, you can't go to places today because of the restrictions or because of safety concerns. You can come into the immersive technology and, and, and really um, be part of that ecosystem. One way we used uh, augmented technology uh, this year um, was early in the year when uh, everything was shut down and, and there was a lockdown in place. We had a customer that bought a industrial um, HP technology uh, to be focused in Alberta. And our technicians were not allowed to travel. Um, there was a company policy in place at that time. Um, so what we did is in partnership with our customer, um, both parties deployed uh, 
augmented uh, headsets. So we were virtually on their site and they were virtually on our site. And they were looking at our machines. We were taking our machines apart, putting them together. And, and it, was a, it was a very unique collaborative effort. And we did our installation of this industrial machine using augmented technology uh, to keep everybody safe. We saved on time. We saved on uh, cost for traveling. And also we, we just kept people safe. And, and the machine was used to create ventilator parts and, and, and medical supplies. So it was a really noble way of getting uh, getting forward using AR technology. Awesome, thanks, Steve. And I know you have touched a few times on you know printing and printing supplies for the pandemic, and you discussed printing face shields during the pandemic. Can you talk a little a bit about the process, uh, how three D printing was involved with the prototyping to production of these uh, supplies during the pandemic? Uh, absolutely. So. When, when the pandemic happened, um, a lot of the colleagues um, on my global relationship um, started leveraging their own printers. I had an Ultimaker at home, right? So um, I started printing parts at home. I had people across the globe that were printing parts. And it gave them the ability to very quickly come up with solutions that typically won't be possible using conventional manufacturing methods, like injection molding or, or even CNC or milling machine process. So very quickly, they were able to come up with this design and share those digital files, allowing people to print. Uh, we printed a lot of face shields here, donated them to uh, Sick Kids Hospital, other hospitals in Canada in need, um, as part of the contribution we did as Camp Micro, because we had access to technology. We were able to pivot very quickly. A lot of companies are in the position right now to pivot. Uh, they're thinking about new ways of keeping the doors open. By having access to industry programming technologies and additive solutions, they were able to come up with designs, solutions rapidly, and, and not wait for long lead times in supply chain. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, so I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, if any questions do arise after we finish here today, please let us know. We're happy to answer those for you. Reach out to your account manager or reply to the email that you'll get um, following this presentation. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. You can connect with us on social. Um, we do have LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So follow us on there. We do post a lot about new and exciting technologies that are coming as Deep has discussed today. And we hope to see you again very soon at some of our other sessions. And don't forget to keep an eye out for our survey for a chance to win some prizes for you and your team. Thank you very uh, much. Si vous souhaite, uh, I'll just finish off by saying, si vous souhaitez communiquer en français, nous serons heureux de vous accueillir avec notre équipe francophone. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.